Have you ever mixed baking soda and vinegar together before? Maybe you wanted to make a baking soda volcano. Or maybe you've put some dry ice in a bottle just to hear a loud bang. Now, I'm sure your neighbors didn't appreciate you making a mess of the neighborhood in either case. When I started considering doing chemistry, I had no idea how many different possible fields there were. Sure, a simple acid-base reaction like vinegar and acetic acid does technically count as chemistry, but that doesn't even start to scratch the surface of some of the possible fields like medicinal chemistry, polymer chemistry, or analytical chemistry, just to name a few. We've talked about a lot of different types of chemistry on this channel, but it helps when you understand what the different types of chemistry are, what their distinctions are, and when chemistry falls into one field versus another. Today's video is sponsored by Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering a box of awesome with top shelf goods from under the radar brands. It's free to join and you can skip a month or cancel any time. 90% of products come from small brands, many of which are based right in the US. Terra Box. The knife in the Terra Box is made by Bare Bones based in Salt Lake City. Forge Box. This Damascus steel knife is made by Buck and Bear Knives located in Pennsylvania. Trail Box. The gut hook knife in the trail box is made by Titan International, located in Illinois. Carnivore Box The American barbecue rub in the carnivore box is made by the Great American Spice Co. in Rockford, Michigan. Every month, Bespoke introduces its members to cool new products, outdoor gear, barware, home and kitchen goods, clothing, and even more. Even live oysters, based on the preference quiz that you'll fill out. Every box of awesome has around $70 worth of goods inside, but costs you only a fraction of the value. Preview your box before it's shipped. You'll get a box of awesome assigned to you, and before it's shipped, you'll get a preview of what comes inside. Decide if you'd like to keep it, swap it for a different box, or skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want. Earlier this year, I got the cask box, which made a fine addition to our decor. I love the aesthetic that this miniature keg adds to our room. This month, Bespoke sent me the Weekender box and the Over Easy box. We had a really fun time cooking pancakes, and they tasted pretty good. I'm sure Mrs. Chemist will love having a cast iron skillet, and we'll definitely be using the bag from the Weekender box the next time we take a short trip. These are only the essentials, I swear. To get 20% off your first box of awesome, click the link in the description and enter That Chemist 20 at checkout, or go to bespokepost.com slash thatchemist20. That way, Bespoke Post will know you came from here. I want to thank Bespoke Post for their support of this channel. In this video, we're going to try something a little different. We're going to discuss what each field of chemistry is. The type of chemistry that focuses on carbon-containing compounds is called organic chemistry. When we say organic in the confines of chemistry, we're intending to communicate that carbon is involved in most of what is studied. Organic chemistry is a popular form of chemistry, and organic chemists often distinguish themselves from other organic chemists by identifying the primary type of work that they do. You could classify me as a method chemist because my research focuses on the development of synthetic methodology. Since most of my research projects involve the development of new methods for other chemists to use when they're trying to synthesize certain types of molecules. What type of molecules, you might ask? How polite of you! My chemistry was mostly fluorine chemistry, as well as sulfur chemistry. If you want to get even more specific, I make sulfur-containing thiocarbonyls, as well as difluoro compounds, especially difluoroethers, and I've developed some new methods for their preparation. In general, organic chemistry deals with carbon-containing compounds, emphasizing the study of their structure, synthesis, and reactions. It also plays a crucial role in drug discovery and the development of new organic materials. I've made a number of sulfur and fluorine-containing compounds, and if I knew what I was getting myself into, I might have considered a different field due to the unbearable stench of some of the chemicals. I just smelled a little bit of it, not even like close to my nose, just like gently wafted towards my nose, and the smell was strong, it stayed there for the rest of the day, and it didn't get weaker in intensity. It was driving me crazy. Organic materials are one form of materials chemistry. They're also a part of polymer chemistry, which focuses on the development of polymers for use in many applications. Polymer chemists often synthesize new monomers, studying the properties of these novel polymers derived from combinations of known and novel monomers. A monomer is just like a single building block of the polymer. A polymer is a bit like a long chain, and the individual chain links in the chain would be like the monomer. 
Polymer chemists often synthesize novel monomers, studying the properties of novel polymers derived from the combination of known and novel monomers with the aim of developing new polymers which could solve one of the many problems that we have in the world. Unfortunately, they can't solve the tar problem that most of their monomers have the propensity of forming. I don't think I've seen a bottle of styrene in the lab that hadn't completely polymerized into polystyrene before. And we used to have methacryl oil chloride, it's like methacrylates but the acyl chloride, and that stuff also had a tendency to entirely polymerize. While the tar that this leaves behind in their flasks is relatively large, there's another type of chemistry involved with something small. That's nanochemistry. Nanochemistry is an emerging subdiscipline of the chemical and material sciences that deals with the development of new methods for creating nanoscale materials. This is distinct from other organic chemists whose work would be described as total synthesis, where the multi-step synthesis of complex natural products is their primary focus. Many organisms contain complex molecules, which are identified by natural products chemists, who focus on the isolation and identification of natural products. Since a lot of the work that is done by natural products chemists involves the use of analytical chemistry, they can also be described as analytical chemists. When you classify someone as an analytical chemist, it implies that most of their work involves the development of techniques for the separation or characterization and identification of some molecules. Analytical chemistry focuses on the identification and quantification of chemical substances and their properties. It involves techniques like spectroscopy and chromatography to analyze samples for various purposes. Forensic chemistry is a subtype of analytical chemistry which can assist in the identification of unknown materials found at a crime scene. Specialists in this field have a wide array of methods and instruments at their disposal to help identify unknown substances. Along with other forensic specialists, forensic chemists commonly testify in court as expert witnesses regarding their findings. They could be analyzing a crime scene for evidence of arson, the presence of drugs or illicit substances, or potentially identifying poisons, to name a few. Since we are living beings, I mean at least I am anyway, as far as you know, the main types of molecules we are interested in are often biomolecules, which can fall under the field of biochemistry and molecular biology. Biochemistry explores the chemicals, reactions, and interactions that occur in living organisms. It includes subfields like bioorganic chemistry and biophysical chemistry, delving into the molecular processes within living systems. Biochemistry is closely related to medicinal chemistry, which focuses on the application of chemistry to the development of new active pharmaceutical ingredients, also known as APIs, for the study or treatment of diseases. Medicinal chemistry is distinct from process chemistry, which is the arm of pharmaceutical chemistry concerned with the development and optimization of a synthetic scheme and pilot plant procedure to manufacture compounds for the drug development phase. Pharmacology is a branch of medicine, biology, and pharmaceutical sciences concerned with drug or medication action, studying how molecules behave in biological systems. Another major field is inorganic chemistry, which is still able to have relevance to medicinal chemistry in the development of metal-containing drugs, such as in the development of platinum-containing drugs, which are used in chemotherapy as anti-tumor agents. Chemotherapy is the use of chemistry for therapeutic purposes. In addition, inorganic chemists frequently utilize organic chemistry for the synthesis of their ligands. Ligands are like chemical decorations for the metal in the center of their complex. You can sort of think of this like an inorganic chemist painting an egg. I'm sorry if that upsets any inorganic chemists out there, but I mean a ligand's on the outside of the metal, an egg is like a metal, and the paint is like a ligand, so I think it's fair to say that you're painting Easter eggs. Not all inorganic chemists study metals, however. A number of inorganic chemists study other inorganic molecules, such as nitrogen dioxide and sulfur dioxide, as well as related metal-free chemicals. These chemists are typically referred to as main group chemists. Inorganic chemists can also make polymeric materials, which include metal organic frameworks, MOFs or MOFs, as well as coordination polymers, and the application of these materials is vast, or so I'm told. One of the main applications of inorganic chemistry is in catalysis. This is a field of chemistry which focuses on the use of inorganic chemicals as catalysts for various processes. Although, if you do catalysis without the presence of a metal, it can be called organocatalysis. Catalysts are important for making processes occur more easily, requiring less energy to activate molecules, and ultimately making processes better. Inorganic chemistry focuses on the study of non-carbon compounds. It examines the properties and behaviors of minerals. The rocks! Hank? No, they're minerals! Metals and inorganic compounds. In summary, inorganic chemistry plays a vital role in material science and catalysis, as well as in medicine. Oftentimes, inorganic compounds feature organic-inorganic interactions. This forms the basis of the field of organometallic chemistry. Whether or not this is a discipline of inorganic or organic chemistry is a matter of semantics, as are all the distinctions that I'm making in this video. The separation of a field into subfields is done for a purpose, and the purpose of this video is to explain the vast types of chemistry which exist.
When radioactive metals are studied, this can fall under the field of inorganic chemistry as well as nuclear chemistry. This would include things like the enrichment of uranium-235 in the separation of depleted uranium, which is uranium-238. I wanted an insight into how it felt to control this incredible power. Can we go launch one? I did something which I feel incredibly bad about. 24 hours later. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Basically, 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 waterproof. While nuclear chemistry often features heavy metals, there are a lot of radioactive elements which are non-metals. For example, fluorine-18 is a radioactive nucleus that is used in PET imaging. PET just stands for Positron Emission Tomography. Some of the applications of PET imaging include the use for imaging cancer, as well as for studying metabolic disorders. The really neat thing about fluorine-18 and other PET radio tracers is that when they undergo radioactive decay, they release a positron. A positron is a form of antimatter, which will form two gamma rays when it comes into contact with regular matter in the form of an electron. This process is called annihilation. While this sounds absolutely insane, this can be used productively. If the radio tracer is an analog of a biomolecule, such as glucose, we could have an analog called 18F fluorodeoxyglucose. This can be concentrated in a tumor, and guess what? When that radioactive decay occurs, you can detect the two gamma rays that come off of that fluorine 18, and that enables you to image the tumor using a coincident detector. As such, PET imaging is part of nuclear chemistry, analytical chemistry, medicinal chemistry, and it's a huge feat of chemical engineering. I didn't even mention how fluorine 18 is produced. They do something called proton bombardment using a particle accelerator. It's awesome. Chemical engineering involves the application of chemistry, physics, and engineering principles to design equipment, systems, and processes for the production of a wide range of products through chemical transformations. Broadly speaking, chemical engineers design processes involved in chemical manufacturing. The main role of chemical engineers is to design and troubleshoot processes for the production of chemicals, fuels, foods, pharmaceuticals, and biological substances, to name a few. They're most often employed by large-scale manufacturing plants to maximize productivity and product quality while minimizing costs. Another major field of chemistry is the field of physical chemistry. Physical chemistry explores the fundamental principles governing chemical processes. It includes topics such as thermodynamics, quantum mechanics, as well as chemical kinetics. Physical chemistry is crucial for understanding chemical reactions and their mechanisms. Oftentimes, theoretical chemistry is used by physical chemists to study the predicted behavior of molecules. Theoretical chemistry is often referred to as computational chemistry, since the application of theory usually involves computer-based simulations and modeling of chemical processes. They asked me how well I understood theoretical physics. I said I had a theoretical degree in physics. They said, welcome aboard. Physical chemistry more broadly can include fields such as photochemistry and electrochemistry, as well as mechanochemistry, just to name a few. Photochemistry relies on energy provided in the form of high-energy photons, which can be really useful in selectively doing unique transformations, which would be really hard to do with heat in a typical thermal reaction. Electrochemistry, on the other hand, is concerned with the relationship between electrical potential difference and identifiable chemical change. This can include the development of chemical batteries and fuel cells, or it could be used for organic synthesis. Since electrochemistry is a widely used area of chemistry, this explanation I've given here is definitely not all-inclusive. Mechanochemistry is the initiation of chemical reactions by mechanical phenomena. This is another way to initiate a chemical reaction. Oftentimes experiments with mechanochemistry are done using a ball mill. Sometimes microwave chemistry is another technique that's used. Rotational chemical reactions are favorable due to the way microwave energy transfers rotational energy to molecules directly. If you wanted to excite molecules using sound, you could utilize sonochemistry, which is able to form acoustic cavitation in liquids using ultrasound, resulting in the initiation or enhancement of a chemical reaction. Speaking of liquids, there's another field called flow chemistry, which runs reactions in a flow system instead of a typical batch chemical reaction, where reactions are done in a flask or reactor. Pumps move fluid into a reactor, and where tubes join one another, the fluids contact one another for a short period of time. If these fluids are reactive, a reaction can take place. Flow chemistry is well established for use at a large scale when manufacturing large quantities of a given material. However, the term has only recently been coined for its application on a laboratory scale by chemists, and describes small pilot plants as well as lab-scale continuous plants. Changing the focus a little bit, we also have agrochemistry, which is the study of chemistry, especially organic chemistry and biochemistry, as they relate to agriculture. This is closely related to environmental chemistry, which is the study of the chemical and biochemical phenomena that occur in natural places. 
Geochemistry, on the other hand, uses the tools and principles of chemistry to explain the mechanisms behind major geological systems, such as Earth's crusts and its oceans. Along a similar theme to agrochemistry, we have food chemistry, which is the study of chemical processes and interactions of all biological and non-biological components of food. Green chemistry is a completely unrelated area of chemistry, and chemical engineering focused on the design of products and processes that minimize or eliminate the use and generation of hazardous substances. Many scientists are critical of green chemistry for doing little to improve most processes on a large scale, and many papers reported to develop green chemistry do little to improve existing processes in any meaningful sort of way. So we have to dispose of this somehow. The atmosphere is nature's bin. <laughs> no, <laughs> I can't say that. No, it's not. It's just my bin. As you can see, there's a lot more to chemistry than something simple like a baking soda volcano. This has probably overwhelmed you by the sheer amount of different fields in chemistry that exist. I hope that this video helped teach you a little bit more about the different areas of chemistry. If I succeeded in teaching you some chemistry, that would mean that I've accomplished some neurochemistry, as neurochemistry is the study of chemicals, including neurotransmitters and other molecules such as psychopharmaceuticals and neuropeptides that control and influence the physiology of the nervous system. I hope that this video hasn't made you too nervous. Now, as long as you're not working with the stinky sulfur chemicals, organic chemistry is probably the best field, and I'm definitely not biased whatsoever. In short, every field of chemistry is essential, and they enable us to address global challenges as they arise. Chemistry touches every aspect of our lives, from the clothes that we wear to the food that we eat, and it holds the key to a brighter future for all of humanity. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day. Basically, Basically waterproof. waterproof.